Welcome back as we unpack Uganda's economic climate and take a closer look at business and investment opportunity to be leveraged off regional integration. That is regional, integra uh, regional muscle uh, works to bolster this economy's competitiveness in a global arena. Still with me is the Honorable Emilia Chambade. She's the Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives in Uganda. Annette Semuwemba, who's the Country Director of uh, Trademark East Africa. Africa, Herman Kasakende, MD of Standard Chartered Uganda, and Mazen Mrue, who's the CEO of MTN Uganda as well. Before we get into uh, the benefits of regional integration and how Uganda can be looking to leverage off this more effectively, let's take a look at other sectors of the economy because we ended off part one looking at the fact that Uganda needs to avoid falling into the trap of becoming a one commodity economy. If we shift to agriculture, I mean, that's the most important sector of the economy. It employs over 80% of the workforce. Take us through what needs to be done right now, ministers, for, for Uganda to move beyond food exports and uh, to place emphasis on trade in manufactured goods and services, because essentially we're looking at beneficiation happening a lot more aggressively. First of all, um, Uganda is an agriculture-based economy. What we need to do now is, um, first of all, we must add value. We must look at, at, at production first. We must look at the value chain. And we look at production, seed improvement, seed multiplication, fertilizers, mechanization of agriculture. Then we move up to processing. We must add value because we've been exporting our commodities in the intermediate space stages or sometimes raw. So it's important to add value. Coffee remains, it's about 30% of our GDP. But you still find that it is exported in its intermediate stage. So after adding value, then we must look at, at the markets. We've been exporting across borders, and that is where Annette comes in, because they're trying to improve on the cross-border trade mm -hmm. and improve on the services there. So we must look at that. But we still remain the food basket because of our soils, because of our types of food. But we are, must do more. In fact, Uganda has the potential to feed the region uh, through more exports specifically, but uh, productivity seems to be an issue diminishing some of that competitiveness. Added to that, some suggest, Minister, that we're not using our biggest natural asset land to actually harness entrepreneurship and that we could be using that as a tool. And if we see profitable land reform specifically and thinking of land as an asset in that regard, that would be the key to unlocking commercial value. We are looking at that and we, we have computerized the land office. We are improving on its services. So we are actually treating that as priority as well, to start using the land optimally. That is also another area we're looking at. Transportation is another important area, transporting commodities from, from the farms to, to the destinations. But all in all, regional integration is the best. Because if you have to sell across, across borders, where are you selling? So we, we have gone into a regional, reformed regional economic blocks so that they could be a market for our goods. For example, East African community has about 149 million. And we are also spreading out to Comesa, which has about 429 million here. And we're working further towards SADC. Before we explore that regional growth even further, I'm skirting across sectors here, and that uh, simply because of uh, time constraints. So Mazen, you interface uh, as MTN with the Ugandan consumer most apparently. What's your sense of the Ugandan consumer right now? And in terms of telecoms operations in the country, what investment are you looking at uh, moving forward with what growth targets? In ICT or in telecommunication, there are three areas where most of the operators are looking for, and MTN is one of them. Uh, the voice or the basic services have been already there since more than 15 years. 
we try to continue developing them and making those services much more accessible and available, reaching more communities and, and rural areas in, in the countries. And here we are reaching, uh, we are looking for more incentives from the governments where we can go and cover rural areas, which require also a cost an investment there, but maybe the return is much more difficult. So this is an area where we are engaged with the governments to go for that. The second area which we see that the, the, the establishment and the rollout of uh, mobile money services, really that's an area which is helping the economy and the traders and the agriculture sector and the other sector as well uh, to make the business much more easier for them and accessible. This is a second. The third one, which is uh, the uh, exposure or the investment that we're making in the internet space. Uh, the access to the internet is also uh, contribute largely to the uh, development, to the national development of the country. These are the three areas where we continue focusing on. And third and fourthly, on the top of all those ones, the, uh, the infrastructure that was put by MTN during the last 15 years has been opened now and is being shared with the other players, which is the most important factor here. Uh, the, in the investment that has been made now is open, and other players are using it to extend their also services. In this context, we have had MTN Uganda announcing that it's considering buying rival local telecom firms, and that following the agreed merger between the number two and number three <laughs> operators in the country. So we could well see the competitive pressure in Uganda ease. And therein lies a very fine line that needs to be walked because how do you, in, how do you weigh investment opportunity against risk? This as the government, and we've seen it globally, becomes more protectionist uh, in some cases of its citizenry and has to walk a fine line itself in terms of uh, you know, making sure that monopolies don't control certain sectors of the economy. I think, uh, without going to the debate whether the, the rumors are correct or wrong, uh, uh, there is a certain levels of uh, growth opportunities in the, in the country, whether vertical or horizontal. Uh, MTN is committed to continue, and I think as a team, as a senior management team for MTN, uh, there is no uh, job for us to stay in the country if there is no growth. So the growth is a, is, is, is a basic objective for us. So this is where we're looking for. Now, uh, the areas that we're looking for as an MTN to continue growing, okay, uh, vary from one level to another level. Uh, with the extension of our services to uh, uh, rural areas, that's one direction. Uh, with uh, going and investing in new technologies, uh, which with the last one, just few few weeks only, the investment in 4G, as you said, is the second after South Africa we're investing. This is really another indicator to tell the rest of the world that Uganda is already on the map of 4G. Uh, this is on the investment in the technology. And thirdly, how can we make our uh, investment much more sustainable uh, in ensuring that the employment opportunity that we are making it on the ground are well educated and full uh, spectrum of uh, different skills are available to educate and also benefit the other industry. Yeah. And it, it is a fine line to walk though where, as I said, many economies globally have started introducing these protectionist policies and where anti-competitive behavior has come under severe scrutiny, uh, you know, for social benefit, but where free market principles need to work to attract investment. I mean, what's your assessment uh, sitting, uh, you know, and viewing the kind of uh, la shifting landscape that's currently underway? I'm, I'm going to give a perspective of the ESC. Um, as the region continues to grow, it is competing against itself, irrespective of all the agreements that have been signed. So there are quite um, fundamental issues to think through as we continue these discussions and uh, as we continue to work together, to think of working together as a regional bloc. Uh, I'll give you some practical examples here in Uganda where we have seen sugar manufactured in Uganda that has not been allowed to cross to the border it has been in clear. Kenya. It is a dispute between Uganda and Kenya for protectionist uh, reasons, not because there wasn't a genuine um, a reason why that sugar couldn't cross. Now, that is a, a perspective within the ESC region. So yes, uh, while we should have the free market, um, it, it, we should have a free market economy, 
it is still reality that even within the ESC, we still have those protectionist measures. Uh, we still have measures of retaliation, as they call them sometimes. And government really works hard through their different offices to try and address these issues, but they are, it's a reality. Um, they remain even within the ESC. Minister, having said that, I mean, in the past we had mutual political distrust amongst the various regional members impeding integration, and that came along with different ideological uh, or political ideal ideologies, uh, different approaches to economic policy at large, uh, and that posed a significant challenge. Now, is it supportive of cooperation? Yes, it is supportive, but I would like to take you back. Um, we had the East African community before. I remember it was dismantled by, by Amin, yes. And so there was that air of mistrust before. But now they, are, they are, have harmonized their thinking. Of course, there were some sus suspicions before, but now they have harmonized their thinking in spite of their political um, affiliations. Or so, and yet we see harmonization coming through. We see these players but singing. But we water. must admit that there are some NTPs, inevitably. But these are technical, which then they can be ironed out. It could once be once identified. Once they've been identified. Yeah. Actually, she's also working on some of them. For example, administrative issues like bureaucracy, red tape, a bit of corruption. But those are being sorted out. Then you have the roads uh, and, uh, and some other issues, but they're being ha handled. Annette, how tough are those East African community negotiation processes and how tough is it to implement decisions accordingly? They're very tough, I must say. Very tough, sometimes lasting into um, very the late hours of the night, but they're very um, positive. Decisions are reached by consensus, so if a, one of the countries isn't happy with that decision, then it's um, bracketed, as they say, until consensus is reached. <clears throat> they are very, um, I think they also take a toll on, on the countries because you require a lot of technical expertise to be able to talk about all the broad range of areas that have to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Treaty for the East African Community, it has um, over 90 articles mm -hmm. and cooperation is across all the areas, political, social, economic, cultural, now, having teams and groups to negotiate, that's not a simple process at all. And um, while we are focusing on the economic aspect of the, of the um, uh, regional integration, there are other aspects as well that are going on. So it's not a simple process, but very positive. Yeah. Uh, let me say something about the regional integration. I think the buzz within the private sector is that we will lead the way, mm -hmm. and uh, when I talked to my uh, friend here, Mazin. We did not wait for the government actually to start working together and iron out all the uh, non-tariff barriers. But I think where he is, he can give uh, a similar tariff if you are an MTN uh, customer travels over to Kenya or to another country. So I think this can be private sector led. And then now, when you go to banking, Standard Chartered Bank uh, can actually offer services for its customers. If you're a Kenyan uh, customer, with Standard Chartered, you can actually access any of our branches in Uganda with, with the same tariff. So I think if we give these initiatives, if we lead the way as the private sector, a lot of this will follow along the way. All of this in an effort to improve the competitiveness of the various members that sit within this region as a whole. At this point, I'd like to open to the floor now for a Q&A session. So members of the audience, if you have a question, please indicate by show of hand um, and then make clear who you're addressing that question to. We'd like to squeeze as many questions in as possible. So please try and keep your questions as concise and to the point as possible. Do we have any questions? Um, I'd like to address this question to uh, the Honorable Minister. Depending on the kind of um, your source of statistic, um, the population of Uganda is estimated to be around the region of 100 to 130 million by 2050. Um, some will say this is uh, positive for the economy in terms of market. Uh, others will say this will blow up 
the vision 2040 that the government uh, has projected in terms of economic growth. Uh, what is your take on this? Well, I, I believe that um, the soaring uh, population of the youth is um, a positive phenomenon for Africa because, first of all, they're productive. Secondly, once we invest in skilling them, then we know that they'll be able to turn over our economies in a more positive um, direction. Where the danger is, is to leave the unskilled to remain unskilled. So once we invest, and according to our vision, we intend to invest aggressively into the productive, I mean, to the youth, because they will be the leaders of tomorrow. So it is positive, I would say. Thank you. Uh, my question will go directly to the Honorable Minister. My concern is that the Ministry of Trade, which you head, has done so little to formalize sectors, businesses in the economy. I don't know if you guys ever think about this. Let's take a, an example of uh, the transport industry in Uganda, which is largely informal. We could start by with Kampala, for instance, and say, to run a PSV in Kampala, you should be a company, or maybe a cooperative, a circle, which is still under your ministry. This way, we'll be generating tax revenue, because at some point, to renew your license, you be, will need to get a tax clearance from URA, we'll need to look at ABCD, we'll need to see if you're paying NSSF to your employees. The sector will be more sustainable. And we can go on and look at all the different sectors and, and, and make this uh, uh, more uh, sustainable. I, I think that will go a long way in supporting and formalizing our small business people. My second point is uh, when you talk of growth of five to six percent, and you think this is good news, Honorable Minister, this is very bad news. Uganda's GDP, as per the numbers that I saw in the current budget framework paper of 2013-14, is about 42 billion. Now, if you're growing at five percent, it means you're adding two billion into the economy annually. You cannot compare this with Europe. In fact, you, should be, you shouldn't even tr think of comparing it with Europe. Let's take a, an economy like uh, Italy, which is among the top 10 economies in the world. Their GDP is at, uh, I just Googled on uh, my phone, uh, and their GDP is 2,194 billion, 2011 numbers. Now, if that economy grew by 3%, which you indicated, although their growth is negative, I watched on uh, CNN yesterday, but uh, if, if it grew by 3%, which you indicated, it would add on to 66 billion into the economy. That is more than the current economy. At that point, let's, let's pause, and uh, because we are running short of time, so we need the minister to address those two issues and uh, then take it from there. Um, I would like to thank the speaker for acknowledging that the Ministry of Trade has improved, that you never heard of it before, and now you're hearing of it. Thank you very much for your compliment. <laughs> then secondly, what is the Minister of Trade doing? First of all, what is the Ministry supposed to do? The Ministry is supposed to create a conducive environment for the traders. And by so doing, it has to design policies. And in designing policies, it has to ensure that they are passed and enforced. Ever since I came into that office, we have worked on several sectors, for example, standards. We had a standard bureau which, was, which had declined completely, but now it has an impact on the community. And we are trying to improve on it to ensure that substandard goods are not coming to the market by introducing another body, a pre-inspection scheme, 
from abroad, although we are getting a lot of resistance. We have organized a number of sectors, but it's not my day today to go into all that because we don't have enough time. But please give me your contact and come to my office. I'll be able to tell you what the ministry has done as far as it is. So there we have it, a formal invitation from then, the minister. Then, yes, uh, as far as the growth is concerned, I'm surprised for you to say that 5.5 is very low. It is extremely high. And I would ask my colleague, my distinguished member of the finance sector, to explain that to you. Um, definitely, um, this wasn't my question, but I would say the a growth of 5% with the potential of 7%, it is not low. It is not low. Um, when you look for the fastest growing economies in the world today, more than 50% of them are in Africa. Okay, and when you, look up, uh, when you talk about the, yeah, the Eurozone, actually two of the largest economies in Europe, which is uh, France and Germany, actually did not grow. And we don't want to go to the US. So if you're looking for the fastest growing economies, more than 50% of them reside in Africa. And I think some of you have heard about the 7% club. I think six, uh, six out of 10, they're actually in Africa and very close to us. I think we've got Tanzania and Rwanda. So 5% is not uh, low growth. Uh, Especially it's a recovery economy. It's a recovery and then um, we are negotiating all these uh, regional blocks. We have negotiated Comesa. Now you are a member of FTA. So we are negotiating all that WTO. We are negotiating with EU. We have negotiated something. So we're doing a lot of work. Please come and see me. I'll give you a little bit. Of course, the work being done to enhance regional uh, economic integration can help Uganda as well break out of its low productivity equilibrium and that by catering to regional economies, uh, realizing economies of scale, which can in turn then drive costs lower and uh, work to enhance its competitiveness moving forward. Minister, you seem to be very popular this evening, but we've had uh, Mukhecha Wahi, who's a Radio 1 listener, sent through a question, and he asks about the Chinese influence on the local economy. Now, we talk about competitiveness. His question is, why doesn't government protect local companies from them? Alicia. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is true that there's been an influx of, of Chinese investments. And we must admit that they're actually offering. Their offers are very big. If they're giving you a loan, their interest is very low. But now we've started being cautious. We're realizing now that we need to move cautiously and we are laying emphasis on the standards. Because we realize that although they're coming in fast, some of the work is substandard. Mm -hmm. So we've started creating some benchmarks. But then the local farms, the local farms, this is a private sector-led sector economy. It is, and it's liberal. So it's very difficult to dictate or stop a Chinese company from coming in. But what we have to do is we're going to sensitize the masses about some of the challenges that one would encounter um, or, or how on how we could protect it. But then we could also avail, as I say, benchmarks to, to the Chinese groups and also tell them what we want. It's mainly to do with quality. I am proud that the two companies up there have really given share their success story because they have succeeded in Uganda. Even as you raise all the issues, these are two companies that have done well. Uh, my question goes to MTNN. We are really proud of you. It's a South African company that invested in Uganda and has grown by leaps and bounds. Your first month in Uganda, there were 10,000 connections. They couldn't believe it. And now they have millions. Brought in new technologies, internet, information, really good corporate social responsibility. Now that we have the submarine cable, internet prices have gone down. Our very young, very educated population speaks very good English, possibilities of Swahili and, uh, and French. How can we, like South Africa, succeed in attracting the call centers? These will 
provide us with jobs, so many jobs. It is available. Uh, access to the submarine cables are all available. Redundancy is available. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm very much uh, sure that this area can be really touched and can be explored uh, with the maximum uh, support from private sector, especially from NPN. Minister, before we take that last question at the back, you in fact have a, a question for one of the members. <laughs> when will the plans of affordable and accessible credit for SMEs? Thank you. Um, this is a very pertinent uh, subject as far as I'm concerned. Ten years ago, our play in terms of Sergio Banks' play in terms of uh, uh, SME, it is my hope that we're going to see a lot more of harmonization between the East African states and the various of, uh, in terms of interest rates or lending rates and inflation should actually come down. But specifically on, on inflation, our rates, the rates in Uganda, the rate in Uganda is about 5%, the headline is 4%, and the call is at about 5.8%. In Kenya, it is in the same region, and uh, Tanzania, I think it's a lot more closer to 10%. But as we get more harmonization in terms of the fiscal and monetary policy, I'm pretty sure that uh, those dynamics or those uh, indicators, the macroeconomic indicators, will, will see a lot more of convergence than they have.